Societies of Democracy Institute in the, uh, on Democracy in the World in 2020 indicate broad declines in indices of democracies that have been going on for a number of years, but that worsened substantially in the last year, uh, in part because of the impact of COVID, but in part because of, uh, of longstanding trends. Um, and there, there's a lot of specifics. We could talk about the details of lots of countries on, on numerous continents here. Um, I, I just want to uh, raise the, the question that immediately jumps out to, from the perspective of a political scientist is what does it mean that there's a trend? Uh, that we see these, uh, these things moving together. Is that because uh, there are common causes that are driving all of them? Is it because there are uh, spillover effects from democratization or uh, the consolidation of autocracy in one country that affect other countries? Is it because of overt efforts by autocracies to undermine democracy in neighboring countries? We know that all of these things are happening. Right? The difficulty is trying to sort them out and trying to definitively uh, attribute uh, causality. And as, as political scientists, of course, we deal mainly in observational data and we're aware of all the limitations that that imposes on the, cons the conclusions we can draw. Uh, but these are the crucial questions uh, that we're going to have to grapple with and that I think the Biden administration is going to have to grapple with as it confronts uh, a much more dangerous and less friendly world uh, in, in the years to come because of, of the decline of democracy. We're sitting here at the end of the third wave of democratization. Um, it's been described by some um, analysts as a democratic recession. And so democracy is, is uh, conventionally thought to have come in three major historical waves. One uh, following the end of World War I, which of course led to the creation of numerous new governments and, uh, and many of them were democratic. Now those early democracies, including one in Poland, uh, were, uh, were, were for the most part short-lived. Many of those uh, uh, found themselves being replaced by authoritarian governments. And there was a counter wave of fascism uh, that started in the 1920s and swelled in the 1930s and became an international force. And during that time, it's clear that uh, Germany, for example, played a very large role in spreading uh, authoritarian regimes uh, in Europe long before it started invading those countries. Right? The, the uh, ideological transnational power of fascism uh, is something that uh, shouldn't be underestimated. And I think we're seeing similar kinds of, uh, of waves of ideas uh, uh, today. After World War II, there was a second major surge of democratization, right? in part because democratic regimes were reestablished in Europe uh, and in, in part because of decolonization, which often led to uh, establishment of democratic governments, many of whom did not last very long. Right? So we, it became conventional wisdom in political science that democracy doesn't uh, last very well uh, in, in poor countries, right? that there's a, a kind of uh, association there, at least an elective affinity between democracy and development. And it seems to be the case that uh, more better, uh, higher levels of economic development are, are more favorable for democracy. Some political scientists uh, around the end of the 1990s, the early 2000s, uh, started to revive the idea of modernization theory, which had come up in the 1960s, right? That uh, there would be an inevitable move Towards democratization as uh, economic growth and prosperity swelled around the world. Uh, but adverse trends since then suggest that that was premature, right? that uh, there are <clears throat> numerous trends involved and numerous forces and uh, inevitability is something that is rarely seen in human history, right? Um, there, there's, there's, uh, things are much more contingent and complex than that. The third wave of democratization uh, is conventionally dated back to 1974 
with uh, the Portuguese um, revolution, um, which and it be it's there was a, 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 a wave of democratization in southern Europe, uh, and uh, uh, Turkey, Greece uh, were also uh, swept up uh, in this eventually. Um, there was uh, a wave of democratization that happened in Latin America, I think for completely unrelated reasons, right, because of the um, Latin American debt crisis, right, which uh, broke in 1982, caused the collapse of numerous authoritarian regimes that had overcommitted themselves uh, in, in dollars, uh, and they, they happened to be replaced by democratic governments. This led to a lot of political scientists believing that um, economic crises were the way to get democratization, right? Because you just had a whole bunch of authoritarian governments that collapsed because of an economic crisis and they were replaced by, by democracies. Um, but uh, others quickly noticed that uh, economic crises can also lead to the demise of democracy. And uh, whether it is a force for democratization seems to depend on whether the previous government was authoritarian or not. All right, so again, contingency plays a pretty important role here. The, the next impetus to this third wave came with the collapse of communism and the dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, and the spread of democratic values and institutions throughout uh, Eastern Europe and, uh, and sporadically and haphazardly throughout the former Soviet Union. And so for a while, it looked like democracy was really on the march. Um, uh, the, uh, and when, when Russia was a democratic country, uh, the opportunity for uh, really, really optimistic uh, plans about how uh, there could be a community of democracies that have common values and work together in multilateral institutions to try to advance common interests uh, took center stage in uh, certainly in American foreign policy making. And I think there was an era of optimism that uh, we've lived through and which we are now beginning to regret. Uh, they were realizing that uh, again, things are more complicated and more contingent than we might've at first hoped. Um, so the end of the third wave now, well, it, it's kind of crested in 2001 or 2005, depending upon which index you look at. Um, at that point, the majority of countries in the world were considered to be uh, free countries, according to Freedom House. They were considered to be at least electoral democracies, and many of them were considered to be liberal democracies, right? Um, according to uh, the varieties of democracy um, uh, categorizations. Now that, was the, that was the high point. And since then, we've seen steady decline in the numbers of democracies and also in the scores that are given to those countries that remain, uh, many of those countries that remain democratic. So we've seen uh, electoral democracies, that is countries that hold elections that seem to be fair most of the time, right? Uh, but that uh, don't guarantee the full range of uh, democratic freedoms um, that we might expect in a fully established democracy. We've seen many of those electoral democracies slip into becoming electoral autocracies. So these are countries uh, that, can, that uh, continue to hold elections and elections continue to be important political events uh, in their, in their uh, lives, but those elections are so manipulated and so um, predictable, right? That they don't, uh, they don't provide a, a credible alternative or real political competition. So that's, that's what's happened in Russia, right? Where a, a country that uh, under Yeltsin uh, was, was democratic, uh, albeit, a, uh, a in many respects, a flawed and, and uh, shaken democracy uh, turned into a, an, an electoral autocracy. We've seen under uh, autocratic governments increasing levels of repression and subversion of institutions. Right? So there's been a tightening uh, across the board. Uh, you see that, for example, in China, where 
uh, you know, it, it's, it's always been an autocratic country, uh, but uh, the leadership of Xi Jinping is much more repressive um, than, uh, the, than the comparatively uh, open uh, autocracy uh, of, of his predecessor, Hu. Um, but on this, at the same time, we see some signs of hope because we see increased resistance uh, across the globe. There's never been a time when ordinary people around the world wanted democracy as much as they did. And it's been wanted in so many different places. The bravery that's been shown by protesters in Belarus over the course of uh, the last six months or so uh, since uh, Lukashenko uh, stole an election that everyone knew was going to be stolen. Right? It was not at all surprising that an autocrat uh, would continue to cheat. Uh, and yet people were outraged and they took their outrage to the streets and they did it for months and months and months and it continues to go on. Uh, although at a, um, at a weakened pace, it's not clear whether this will have any lasting impact or not. But last fall, we were, unsh we were enough, uncertain enough that when we had a, uh, a meeting like this, we said, well, we don't know which way Belarus is going to go. And it, it, it could, this could be the turning point. Uh, it could be this weekend, uh, was what we were saying. Um, but that sort of increased resistance has happened uh, across the, the, the globe. It was remarkable to see people demonstrating for democracy in the Arab Spring. Right? Um, and as we know, that didn't turn out very well in most countries. Um, and uh, um, it, it led, if anything, to even more repressive regimes in most cases. And, um, but it was a sign of the appetite that the global population has for democratic governance. Um, now, <clears throat> so one of the features of the third wave was that it became broadly conceived of as illegitimate to be a closed authoritarian regime. Right, to be a regime that doesn't at least go through the motions of being democratic. So most authoritarian regimes now actually claim to be democratic. They claim to, uh, to uphold democratic rights and freedoms uh, and they, they hold elections. And the most common way that a country becomes democratic now is that the authoritarian government botches its, uh, its unfair election. Right, so that it, uh, it holds the election. Everybody knows that they're going to cheat. Uh, they cheat, but they don't cheat well enough. People realize that, uh, the, that the cheating is happening, is becoming too overt, uh, and, and, and public uh, um, disapproval breaks out and, and uh, it breaks out in protest. And so this has become a, the common path to democratization. And that was a path that wouldn't exist if you didn't have these sorts of institutions. Countries adopt these institutions in part because there's an international norm, which is supported by leading uh, players in the international system, the United States and the European Union, right, which provide tangible and intangible benefits to countries that play the game of being democratic, right, that liberalize, that uh, guarantee labor rights, right, or guarantee uh, rights of assembly and, and so forth. So, <clears throat> there's been a progressive adoption of human rights treaties, the point where most countries in the world have signed up for most of these treaties, including most authoritarian governments. And countries that sign human rights treaties, in most cases, are actually more likely to uh, observe human rights than countries that don't. And so this, somehow these have an effect. In part, I think this has an effect because it subjects you to uh, domestic pressure and that provides a coordination point for domestic opposition to rally around and point out the hypocrisy of the leaders if they're failing to lead up, uh, to, to um, uh, carry out an international commitment that they've made. And so these human rights treaties spread in part because the European Union pushes for them to be adopted right, by, uh, by its trading partners. 
Um, so there's a uh, this sort of informal normative suasion has an effect. Um, at the same time, there's an escalating hostility towards democracy on the part of authoritarian countries, and particularly Russia, which sees this as the leading threat uh, to, to uh, Putin's welfare and to the stability of his regime. And he's seen a series of color revolutions around, uh, around the world and, uh, and particularly in the former Soviet uh, countries of the former Soviet Union. He sees that as the leading threat to his power. And so he has acted to try to under them and to try to push uh, a counter narrative. Uh, in uh, 2019, he famously declared liberalism to be obsolete. Uh, and he has been uh, uh, viewing the spread of democracy anywhere around the world as evidence of um, sort of malevolent action by the CIA and somehow uh, evidence of US subversion. Right? Um, so there are, I think, some reasons to believe that there are common features that are driving the decline of democracy in recent years, in particular, the last four years, the United States has been absent from the scene. We have not been trying to promote democracy uh, or human rights. And uh, uh, Joseph Biden has uh, just recently declared uh, that America is back. And this uh, may not uh, make everyone around the world happy, but it probably is good news for those who are campaigning for democracy and human rights and bad news uh, for autocrats like uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, the European Union, is, I've mentioned several times, is a really important force for democratization and liberalization around the world. It was an, the normative example that pulled the East European countries along um, through a lot of difficulty through the 90s when they were struggling with political and economic transitions. The sort of shining beacon of joining the European Union um, as being a, a, a possibility was a, a tremendous impulse uh, to, their, to their reform efforts. Uh, and I have to say, I think that that beacon is dimmed in recent years. Um, the, uh, the, the Euro crisis played an important role there. Right? The, the, the European Union became associated with illiberal policies um, that were oriented towards collecting for creditors rather than uh, helping common people. Uh, in, in Greece in particular. And I think that put a, uh, a dark mark on the European uh, Union's uh, reputation. Uh, the um, Brexit has got to uh, be a, a staggering blow right, to the European Union's uh, reputation and, um, and, and momentum moving forward. Uh, and taking Britain out of the European Union is, is harmful in many other ways. Right? Uh, and then we have the crisis within the European Union that uh, uh, Hungary is now the first, been declared the first European Union member uh, that is no longer a democracy, right? according to uh, Freedom House and, uh, and VDEM. <clears throat> and we've seen the, the, the government in, in Hungary consolidate power, uh, trample on the media, um, and uh, rewrite laws and, and control the, uh, the judiciary. Poland, similarly, uh, is really challenging, uh, the, uh, pushing the boundaries of democratic governance in the European Union. And it uh, remains to be seen. Um, with, at what point the European Union will draw a line and insist that no democratic norms really have to be upheld. Um, the, <clears throat> uh, the, the last presidential election uh, in 2020 in Poland uh, you know, was, was very disappointing in the degree of manipulation of the media, um, a very heavy handed way, right, which does tend to undermine right, the credibility and legitimacy of elections. Um, so there's much more that could be said about, about many, many countries, uh, but I think maybe it's time to turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Gretchen Helmke, um, and uh, you can give us a comparative perspective on this. Sure, great. 
<clears throat> um, first of all, I just wanted to thank the organizers for putting together this excellent series and for inviting me to be a part of the conversation. I, I honestly can't think of a more important or timely topic right now. So, so thank you all for organizing it. Um, I guess what I wanted to do is really just sort of continue um, in the vein that, that Randy was going and, and sort of set the stage for our conversation by sharing a couple of observations about democratic backsliding globally, but then really focusing in on the United States, which um, although my research has really been focused on Latin America for the past two decades, over the past few years, I've become increasingly interested uh, in the United States and um, have been a part of this initiative called Brightline Watch, which uh, brings together a group of academics to monitor the health of democracy. And I'll be sharing uh, some of the results and some of the um, some of the insights that that we've had over the over the last few years in, in trying to track democracy in the United States. So the first thing um, to note is uh, just kind of piggybacking off of Randy's observations about how widespread this wave of autocratization has been. Uh, so as I was preparing for my remarks today, I got something in my inbox, which was the latest report by VDEM. Uh, so Randy and I have been reading the, the 2020 version. Well, the 2021 version just dropped uh, an hour and a half ago. And, and the title is kind of revealing. Um, the title of the VDEM report is Autocratization Turns Viral. Uh, so it's an interesting report. It's um, you know basically um, showing that some of the trends in terms of how autocratization is affecting basically all regions of the world and and deepening um, is is continuing uh, into 2020, but also showing um, some of the impact that the pandemic and that COVID has had on, on this trend. So um, just to give you a couple of, of tidbits from this latest report, um, the first thing they note is that electoral autocracy uh, now is the most common uh, regime type, right? So outnumbering the number of democracies as well as the number of sheer autocracies. Uh, together with closed autocracies, they number 87 states or it's home to 68% of the world population. So 10 years ago, 48% of the world population lived under autocracy or electoral uh, uh, autocracy. Today, it's, it's 68%, right? So that's been a huge uptick um, in the last decade. Um, second observation that they make is that um, this is, is again affecting all regions of the world, right? It's not something that's just going on in Poland. It's not something that's just going on in the United States. It's something that uh, that is affecting um, all, all regions. Um, the other uh, thing that they note is that um, the level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen in 2020 is now down to levels last found around 1990. Right. So this means that a lot of the gains from that third wave of democratization that uh, Randy was talking about have basically been lost and we're back to the 1990 levels. And then just in terms of what's happened over the last year in response to the pandemic, they note that uh, two thirds of all countries have imposed restrictions on the media and one third of all countries have had emergency measures without a time limit. So they say the final toll on democracy may turn out to be high unless restrictions are eliminated immediately after the pandemic ends. So that's a really um, sort of sobering thought. Um, what I wanna talk about is, um, I guess the next observation that I wanna highlight is that this third wave of autocratization looks really different from the second wave of autocratization. So in the second wave, which occurred in the 1960s and 70s, particularly in the part of the world that I study, Latin America, basically you had, when you had democracies dying, you had them die very quick deaths, right? And they were usually at the hands of the military. So it would be a coup. Um, it, was a, it was kind of a clear process in which military leaders would take power, um, often under the promise 
of returning to democracy once things sta were stabilized. Although, as we know, in, in places like Chile, right, that, that often took uh, several years for the military to hand power back over to democratic leaders. Um, the rollback that's occurring now, though, looks really, really different from those, um, from those earlier grabs at power. So a couple of things to note. So the first thing is that we're seeing leaders who are elected in free and fair elections be the ones who are sort of attacking democracies from within, right? And they're doing it often under the guise of, you know, not just following the rules, but actually reforming or cleaning up the system, right? The draining the swamp phenomenon is you know something sort of a hallmark signature of the Trump administration, but that promise to uh, clean up the system really as sort of a ruse for grabbing power has been a really common tool that would be autocrats have used uh, all over the world. So just to give you a couple of examples from Latin America, when Chavez came to power uh, in the 1990s, one of the reasons that he was so popular and one of the reasons that he was able to uh, grab so much power institutionally is because citizens were so fed up with corruption, right? So when he went after the courts, when he went after Congress, um, he did that with enormous support from the people. Uh, same thing happened, you know, a decade earlier in, in Peru under Fujimori. Um, so these are often really popular refor reforms that are occurring, right? And then under the guise of reforming, the executive is just accruing more and more power. Um, so this, this process of erosion is, is gradual. Um, scholars have broken it down into, um, a, in, into a sequence and, and said that it kind of follows a couple of different phases. So there's a, there's a really, um, there's a book that's gained a lot of traction, at least among uh, political scientists, this book by Levitsky and Ziblatt, How Democracies Die. And I think they have a really nice description of this process. Um, they basically talk about the autocrat or would-be autocrat first capturing the referees, right? So doing things like passing anti-libel laws, uh, or if you can't you know, do it formally through the rules, you just attack the media and discredit them uh, as fake news. Um, also going after the courts, right? The idea of, um, of basically packing the judiciary with, uh, with um, you know, sympathetic uh, judges, if not crony judges, that's a tactic that's been used um, over and over again uh, throughout the world. Um, then also going after the opposition. And again, this can occur in, in sort of very blatant ways by outlawing parties. A more subtle way though, is to create this kind of discourse that frames anyone who opposes the regime as, as basically, um, you know, not being a true citizen of that country, right? Not being a real American or not being, uh, you know, uh, uh, not, not being a real um, Venezuelan, uh, not being a real Peruvian, right? So really going after the opposition uh, in a number of ways. And then finally, at the very end, going after free and fair elections, right? So that's generally the last phase in, in this erosion process. And you see this systematically in something like the VDEM data. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at this year's report, but in last year's report, they show this very clear trend of a lot of these you know, top 10 cases where we think about democratic erosion. The first thing that got attacked was civil society and these institutions of free, you know, free press, um, then horizontal institutions of accountability, and only then uh, going after uh, free and fair elections. And one of the most alarming things uh, that came up in the, in the report from last year is that you really started to see that index of um, clean elections uh, uh, dropping, dropping substantially. Um, so, uh, you know, with all of these things said, um, in, the 20, in the 2016 campaign, a number of scholars, um, I think became really concerned that they were tr they were starting to see things that they had th that they had witnessed in other countries that led to the erosion of democracy starting to take place in the United States during the campaign. Right, you had this candidate who was rising, 
uh, you know, first within the Republican Party and then uh, obviously won the presidency, you had somebody really for the first time uh, at, at that kind of level of popularity at that level of power, uh, you know, declaring that the elections were rigged, um, talking about throwing his opponent into jail, uh, basically talking about the need to uh, get rid of experts and institutions, making claims he alone could fix it, right? And and a lot of this was dismissed as as rhetoric at the time, but for people who study autocratization, all of this was uh, extraordinarily um, alarming. So uh, my reaction to it was um, first to write an open letter, uh, flagging all of these things right for the election, um, kind of pointing out how dangerous this sort of rhetoric was for any democracy, including the US. And uh, that letter got signed by something like 500 political scientists within 24 hours. And that, that was published in the Washington Post a day before the election. Um, obviously Trump won the election. And, and so in the months after that, um, I formed this organization called Brightline Watch with three other colleagues, two from Dartmouth, one from the University of Chicago, um, and, and two of those other colleagues are, are people who have really built their career on, on studying Latin America, but were equally um, sort of struck by what was going on um, in the United States. So um, what we've basically done during these last four years is repeatedly poll experts, both political scientists. So the poll goes out to uh, basically all political scientists in, in American institutions, and then as well as um, the public. So we work through YouGov to conduct um, a series of polls every three or four months um, that basically asks the same battery of questions over and over again. There's just sort of a global question about how you know well do you think democracy is doing, but then we really try to drill down on different principles of democracy. So everything from free and fair elections to checks and balances to sort of norms of democracy, which I'll come back to uh, in a minute. And we kind of track responses, um, both what the experts have to say, and then just sort of how polarized the public is in terms of how they're viewing um, democracy. And this kind of brings me to the third observation that I wanted to make. So what did we learn from, from, from this exercise? Well, the, the title of the organization is Brightline Watch. Uh, and basically what we learned is that there are no bright lines um, in Amer American democracy. Um, let, me, let me say what we mean by bright lines. Uh, it actually goes back to um, just a really basic theory of democracy, um, which can trace its origins back to John Locke, but which has been more recently articulated uh, by folks like Barry Weingast at, at uh, Stanford. And, and the idea here is that for democracy to continue, right, for it to be consolidated, it needs to be a self-enforcing equilibrium. And, and what that means, essentially, is that it has to be the case that the leader is incentivized to follow the rules of the game, right? All leaders, whether they're democratically elected, whether they're autocrats, we can assume they generally want to stay in power, right? So how is it that you get a leader to comply with the basic tenet of democracy, which is that power is temporary, right? At any time in an election, you may lose power and you need to step down peacefully. Well, the idea of bright lines is that citizens in a democracy are basically the people who enforce those bright lines. And they do it in a couple of ways. Um, basically, they do it by recognizing that there are common values and principles and laws that matter for democracy and that are worth defending. And then the second way they do it is by agreeing to set aside their differences and basically uh, punish a leader. And by punish, I mean withdraw support from a leader who would transgress those boundaries, right? So if everything's working well, you never actually see the transgression take place, right? Because the leader is deterred from uh, transgressing the law because he or she knows 
that if they do that, the citizens will coordinate and come together and, and throw, you know, throw the bum out. Okay, so basically what we decided to do to measure this empirically is to think about this in terms of a compound consensus. Right, so do citizens agree on what these values are? And so across these 30 principles, we looked at responses across the aisle to see, you know, how important were free and fair elections? Uh, how important are, uh, you know, equal voting rights? How important are uh, transparent uh, campaign contributions to Republicans and Democrats? And we actually found some consistent and some pretty good news there, right? In terms of just expressing support for these values, Democrats and Republicans uh, tend to all see most of these things as quite important and to rank them uh, in, in roughly the same order. Right? First condition of compound consensus was, uh, was, was largely met. Now, the second you know, condition of compound consensus is agreeing on whether the principles are actually being violated or being upheld, the, upheld by the government. And of course, that's where you start to see the consensus absolutely disintegrate, right? So in 2016, or sorry, 2017, when we first start measuring this, we see quite a bit of uh, division across the public in terms of uh, say how well the um, you know, government is upholding uh, judicial independence or limits uh, according to limits of the Constitution, right? But the big trend that we saw is that those gaps just open up over the course of the administration. So, um, you know, there are some principles where it's just consistently, uh, you know, flat and separate, but there are quite a few principles where there started out to be rough agreement. And uh, by the end of the administration, there, it, it's just, you know, really, really night and day. So we're still kind of looking at this data. There are lots of ways of, um, of assessing it, but, but that's kind of one of the big pictures uh, that comes out of, um, out of the past uh, four years. Um, the other observation that I think uh, is really important when we're thinking about democratic erosion um, is this idea that informal norms and institutions matter, right? So this is something um, that a number of scholars have brought up. It's something that lies at the heart of that book that I mentioned by Steve Levitsky and Dan Ziblatt. This idea uh, that however you know, good the constitution is, right? A piece of paper is, is, is not gonna save anyone from uh, you know, a, a would-be autocrat. Um, and of course, in the United States, we really saw, you know, how, well, first of all, just how few, how few formal rules there actually were in place constraining the executive and how much as a democracy we had really relied on informal norms, right? Just thinking about taxes, you know, as, as one example. Um, they, again, the, the Levitsky and Ziblatt book, they um, argue that, uh, you know, there are really two master norms that are important for sustaining a democracy. So the first one is the norm of mutual toleration. And this is uh, fundamental um, in the sense that uh, it really is about lowering the stakes of losing power in a democracy. So the idea of mutual toleration is that, of course, in democracy, there are disagreements, but um, the idea that the other side, you know, the other political party, the other candidate, if they win, it's not going to pose an existential crisis, right? That, that it's, uh, there are always going to be disagreements. That's a good thing. But, um, but to have toleration for uh, you know, people uh, who have different beliefs from you and then kind of laddering all the way up to politicians to have toleration for the idea that the other side uh, may come to power. Um, so that's a really, a really crucial norm for them. And then the other norm they talk about is this norm of inter-party forbearance. And that's really um, a norm at the uh, elite level where elites refrain from pushing laws to their absolute limit 
in order to uh, enhance their own power or um, entrench themselves uh, in power. Um, and so I think, I think these are two really interesting ideas. Um, I guess in my own work, I would say a couple of things though that, that I guess they don't contradict what Levitsky and Ziblatt say, but they're, they're slightly different. So the first one is um, in their view, they tend to think of norms purely in terms of moral commitments or values, right? So at various points, and you see this in a lot of punditry, in a lot of the media, you know, this question of why don't politicians put country over party, right? Over uh, and over again. And, you know, in the, in the work that I've done and, and the work that most of my colleagues um, in, in the political science department do is, you know, we think values are important, but we also really want to think about incentives, right? What are the incentives that political elites are, are facing? And, and secondly, like formal institutions often shape those incentives. So we don't want to think about informal norms as being purely value commitments, and we don't want to think about them as being orthogonal to the constitutional order. We want to think about them as basically emerging out of the constitutional order. Uh, so just to give a very um, quick uh, example of this, I have a, a, a recent paper with um, one of my colleagues, Jack Payne, and, and Mary Kroger that looks at the collapse of the norm of mutual, um, uh, of mutual forbearance with respect to gerrymandering and with respect to uh, voting rights, right? And our argument is that we basically had the same constitutional order the entire time, right? Constitutional interpretations have changed given Supreme Court uh, precedents and all of those things. We've essentially had the same order. What we don't have is now we have uh, you know, partisan sorting and that's sort of activated uh, these latent opportunities in the constitution for one party to push the, um, you know, the, the law to its limits and try to crack down on on voting and try to push um, partisan redistricting um, in a way that that uh, enhances its own power. Um, I think I only have what five two minutes left. I don't know where I am in terms of time. Does anyone? Five minutes or so. Oh great. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, just kind of continuing with this observation about norms. Um, I think I would add a third norm to this forbearance and mutual toleration discussion. I think I would add the norm of truth telling. Um, there's, uh, you know, I think this is this is really fundamental to uh, a representative democracy, and I think we've seen it shredded under the last administration. Uh, we've also seen it, um, you know, this same kind of move. Uh, Against uh, against the norm of truth telling by you know autocrats uh, all over the world. Um, just to give uh, one you know one quick statistic, according to the Washington Post, during the Trump administration, um, Trump told some thirty more than thirty thousand lies during the administration. Right, so it's a common uh, point that people make that well politicians only lie. Well, usually they don't tell. Um, 30,000 lies. And I think what, what made these so different is that many of them were observably false, right? So there's a really interesting paper that came out in the annual uh, review of sociology a couple of years ago that was, that was trying to make sense of this and was trying to understand sort of two things, why, you know, why leaders would tell lies that are observably false, you know, things like crowd size, right, or weather patterns, or electoral college margins, right, things that, like, you can look up and you just know are, are, are not correct. So why you would do this and why this wouldn't seem to have an effect on, on your support, right? Why the base, uh, in this case, um, would basically, uh, you know, continue to think of Trump as maybe he lies, but he's really authentic, right? So how do you make sense of that puzzle between lying and, and authenticity? And the way that they explained it, um, I thought was really interesting. 
it was it was basically distinguishing between special access lies, so lies that if the politician is caught out, um, you know, then uh, you know they're trying to cover it up, which is basically reinforcing this norm of truth telling, versus observable lies where you're telling it actually to signal to to your supporters that. Um, that you don't support the basic norms held by other elites, right? So it's a tactic often used by populist leaders in a bid to gain popular support. It's a, it's a way of basically saying, you know, I am sending a costly signal where I'm getting all of this blowback from elites, right? Because I'm not following the rules of the game, but by not following the rules of the game, I'm sort of signaling to you uh, that I'm one of you. So it's a it's a really interesting um, idea, and I think it I think it warrants um, some further uh, research. But I you know I think this this question of of lies is is really foundational to understanding democratic erosion. And so this brings me I guess to the like final minute of my comments, which is um, the big lie. Uh, and what happened in, in, in 2020, right? The big lie is this claim that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, there's no credible evidence for this whatsoever. Uh, this claim has been dismissed over and over again by local officials, by courts uh, on every level. Um, yet uh, in poll after poll, and we've really seen this in the Brightline Watch, um, polls, this has absolutely divided the country in two. So in the latest polling that we did just a month ago, we asked people about how credible they thought the last election was. And, you know, more than 90% of Democrats think that the election was free and fair. They have confidence in the national level, the state level, uh, the local level. Uh, less than 20% of Republicans think that the election was free and fair, right? And the interesting thing about this is that the groundwork for this lie was laid back in 2016, right? If not earlier, this idea that uh, fraud is a problem has been used uh, basically by the right to try to curtail voting rights for quite a long time. It really accelerated in 2016, when uh, you know the Trump campaign started talking about things being rigged, but then we just saw it exponentially increase uh, in the 2020 election. Um, and I think you know this is this is just a fundamental challenge to democracy that we're going to have to grapple with, um, you know, for uh, perhaps you know the next generation, right? How do we restore the belief among a third of Americans? that elections in America uh, actually um, function in the way that they should. Um, so I have a, a bunch of other things to, to say, but I think I've gone on long enough and I wanna open up the, um, the floor for discussion. So I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs>